In today's episode, we open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 24. Driven by a restless curiosity and pride, David commands a census to be conducted throughout Israel and Judah. However, this decision curiously incurs the wrath of God, resulting in a devastating plague that strikes the land. As the consequences of his actions unfold, David is humbled, and he realizes the gravity of his mistake. Through the intervention of the prophet Gad, David seeks God's mercy and receives instructions for atonement. That and more today. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Friday, July 14th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is made possible in part by a generous gift from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Whether you're looking for a catechism, a hymnal, or a Bible storybook, or a devotional in a foreign language, LHF provides these resources free of charge to pastors, missionaries, and lay people who need them. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes Lutheran books and materials that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. To learn more about LHF and how you can partner with them in this vital mission work, visit their website at lhfmissions.org. Don't forget the S on the end. That's lhfmissions.org. Well, this morning, to help us completely wrap up 2 Samuel with chapter 24, to help us divide and discern this last chapter of this book, you know, with 1 first, first Samuel and now 2 Samuel, we seems like we've been We've been in this text for a while, but I'm I'm great to I'm glad glad and grateful rather to have the Reverend Jacob Heine, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas, as my guest. Good morning, Pastor Heine. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Pastor Boo. Thanks for having me on. It's always good to be on Thy Strong Word and to join you for the first time in this program. Oh, yeah, that is right. You are you have been on the program before, but not with me. And since it is uh, your first time with me. I would love to have you share a little bit about yourself, you know, uh, where you're from, where you're going, how God is working through you and the saints there at Faith Lutheran Church. I'm sure many of the listeners would like to hear, too. Absolutely. Well, I was born and raised in Michigan. Uh, that's the ancestral home. The family settled in Frankenmuth, so we're longtime uh, Lutherans uh, coming out of there. And I've had the, the privilege of serving uh, several different congregations now here at Faith in Topeka, uh, congregation that just celebrated this past month its 75th anniversary of ministry here in uh, this wonderful city. We were looking forward to the future and looking forward to what God is doing here. We do believe that God has called us to to lean in in faith to what he has given to us in word and sacrament and to share that with the world around us. And so that's our mission and that's what we're always working towards and, and uh, striving for. I also learned uh, just recently this morning that your DCE and my DCE were college roommates. So that uh, it's another oh. connection between the two of us. What an interesting connection. Yo, I, our DCE here at St. John, uh, Jessica Blocker, she is phenomenal. She does an amazing work for the, for the church and for the kingdom here, and we're so excited to have her. I, uh, I certainly pray that her former roommate is doing the same for you and the saints there. Absolutely. Uh, my DC, Heather McCormick, is uh, absolutely a stellar, wonderful servant of God. She's been a blessing uh, to this congregation longer than I've been here, but a blessing uh, to this congregation and to me as well as, as pastor. So it's great working with her, and she uh, let me know that connection between us today. That's neat. I'll have to share that with my DC later on today. Well, um, our text for this morning, as I've sort of said many times, is the very last chapter of the book. I'm happy to have you uh, kind of put the finishing touches on our study. Uh, we're going to be moving on Monday to the book of Acts. So I, I guess I'm getting tired of pronouncing all these Hebrew names. Yesterday's, <laughs> oh my goodness, yesterday's text uh, had must add a hundred. Well, actually, I know it had like 35, but it had 35 different Hebrew names. It was absolutely crazy. Today, not as bad, not as bad, but uh, still some curious things left to cover. Uh, it's not just you know, when we read Paul's letters, sometimes the last chapters are just sort of saying hello to people. Not here. There's kind of an incident that goes on in this text. But before we get into it, would you lead us together uh, in some prayer, brother? Absolutely. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that comes to us uh, through Scripture, through your grace and love. We thank you that uh, we can take the time to 
to dive in and to see how you work in the lives of the saints before us, but even how you work in our lives now. I guide our study and our time together that the word that we read and that we take in would be nourishing for us and that we would certainly read, mark, and inwardly digest all this so that it would bring you glory and uh, further your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, before we get into the text, would you like to catch folks up, though? You know, people have been walking with us through First and Second Samuel for many, many, many weeks now. Sometimes they miss one or two things. Um, maybe just hit a couple highlights, whatever you think that might uh, establish a good foundation for us to move into today. Like, where are we in history? What's, what's, what's happening? And um, <laughs> why, I don't know, where are we at with the kingdom here at the end of Second Samuel? Yeah, Second Samuel uh, wraps up. There's a lot of David's ministry, obviously, uh, happening in the, the the 10th century BC. So we're around 970 or so BC, probably. Um, and David's life is wrapping up. It's coming to an end, and he's already prayed. He's had his uh, final uh, prayer and his song of deliverance. He's kind of looked at. Uh, his whole life and things are kind of wrapping up now. And the interesting thing about Second Samuel is it doesn't end with his death. His death is left to the beginning of First Kings. Second Samuel 24 is, is kind of like the period or maybe the exclamation point on everything that's kind of come before. And it wraps up two major themes that have been have been running through uh, most of Second Samuel, and that's especially David's desire to build a temple. Uh, that we saw in 2 Samuel 7, and then also the ramifications and the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah and how that has played out. And really that comes to its fullness here where that punishment and all that has gone with it comes to a close. And so uh, 2 Samuel 24 is a, a wonderful way to kind of put an exclamation mark on David's life and to, to wrap everything up in a beautiful way. Absolutely. But it begins sort of auspiciously. I'm going to go ahead and read. Uh, let's see here. It's divided into three sections by the ESV, so I'm going to read the first section. Um, it begins, And again the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go throughout all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May Yahweh your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Actually, I want to stop right there. That's the end of verse 4. So, <laughs> you talk about an exclamation point. You know, we just got done hearing about the, the you know, David SEAL Team 30 and all the mighty men and all the things they had done, and, and we hear the oracle of David, and, and the last chapter begins by saying, well, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel again. Uh, it, it seems to be they can't escape it. They they just can't do what is right. But this part's curious because it says, and he incited David against them. So I guess help us understand what's going on, why David's doing the census, did God order it, and then why is God mad about it? Mm, yeah. So, I mean, the key to this is the anger, again, the anger uh, of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And this goes back to uh, the the form and the content of 2 Samuel uh, 21 through 24. They, it's built chiastically. So the first thing you got in, in chapter 21 was the famine that God sent against Israel because of King Saul's broken agreement with the Gibeonites. And now we get the plague basically of that's brought against David because of his selfishness, which is tying us back to uh, the punishment and the, the ramifications, as it were, the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11 and how that comes about. So you kind of have the, the book end of this section 
with what God is doing here. Uh, the chronicler says that Satan was incited against David, which we know from Job that uh, you know Satan has no power that God has not uh, allowed him to have or any uh, you know abilities that God has not allowed him to have. So Samuel here rightly attributes uh, this inciting uh, to God and the bringing about of of what what's going on in David's life. So he was tempted the first time and fails in 2 Samuel 11. And here he's tempted again. And the question is, what will he do, right? Is he, is he, has he learned his lesson as it were from before? Has he, will he trust in God and trust in God's plans and God's ways above his own? And uh, the, at first glance, it appears, no, right? He, he doesn't, he, He's incited. He decides he's going to count his people. He wants to count his armies. He's going to trust in the, in the power of man and the power of man's sword up and above God. And even Joab, he, he is, you know, his right man he, here, says, no, don't do it. Yeah, you don't want to do this. Uh, God, God will take care of it. He'll give you more than you need. But the king's word wins out, and Joab sends uh, is sent out with his commanders to count the the mighty men of Israel, all the the men who are able to fight on on behalf of the king. Let's talk about that thing you first mentioned, right? So the parallel to this is in First Chronicles chapter twenty one, and and the text there, as you noted, was a little different. It says, "Then state them, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel." So the accuser. Satan stood against Israel. The accuser, Satan, incited David. But here in 2 Samuel, it says, and it just says, and he, assuming Yahweh here, incited David against them. So so people might ask, and have asked for centuries, <laughs> why would God uh, incite David to do something that's against God's will? Why would Samuel, well, the author of 2 Samuel, I should say, why would he attribute this to God rather than to what the chronicler uh, attributed to, and that is Satan himself? And I think one way we can look at this, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree, is that, and you did mention it too because you brought up Job, that, that Satan can't do anything except that God permits it. People get that wrong idea that somehow God, Yahweh, Jesus, that's the good, nice God, and then there's this evil, wicked being, godlike being, Satan, and they're always in constant battle, and it gives us this impression that Satan is somehow just as strong and powerful and omnipotent and omniscient as God, and yet he's absolutely not. Um, so while God certainly doesn't tempt people to sin, Satan can do nothing except that God allows it, and why God allows it is certainly a, a subject of much, of much uh, study. But still, it, it, am I understanding that correctly here? That perhaps that the reason why it just talks about Yahweh being the one who is inciting David is because ultimately God's in charge no matter what. And that would be certainly my take on this, and I believe that would be the the ancient church's take on this. You know, we look at the theology of the cross, and you know, we, we can't explain away God. We can't ex you know try to to rationalize why God does what he does. I and mean, we have, we don't know God's reasoning here. It doesn't explicitly say, um, other than it connects it back to, uh, first Sam or second Samuel 21 and connects it back to the sin with Bathsheba. So we know there's a connection there, but God's reasons are God's reasons. Yeah. And he allows David to be tempted by Satan. Um, and we know David has a pride issue and, uh, and a power, a thirst for power. We've seen it before. And so here, he, you know, he falls prey to that temptation. You know, God strengthens our faith through, uh, through temptation and through the, the struggle with sin. And so, you know, Chemnitz actually said in one of his writings that, you know, God is said to have incited David because it was punishment for sin. And, mm. you know, Again, we don't know all the reasons. We're not giving them here in Scripture. We just have the, the dots to connect back to certain events in the life of David. Well, Joab tried to talk him out of it, but of course the king is the king. We're going to read what happens next now with verses 5 through 9. 
They crossed the Jordan and began from Aror, from the city that is in the middle of the valley, toward Gad, and on to Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon. And they came to the fortress of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negeb of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel there were eight hundred thousand valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were five hundred thousand. So before we get into the next where David kind of recognizes this, and um, any significance here? I mean, we have the numbers, right? Eight hundred thousand um, in Israel. Uh, and the men of Judah were 500,000. They're still kind of dividing them up this way. They they always had. Uh, but I love how they say 800,000 valiant men in Judah who drew the sword and and the men of, I'm sorry, in Israel, but the men of Judah were 500,000. <laughs> Do you think there's anything significant about the, 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 the extra adjectives being added to the men of Israel? That is a really great question. I'm it was just searching my notes here to see if I had anything uh, specific on that. Um, I don't, for what it's worth. I just, it yeah. just stood out to me. <laughs> it's interesting. I think, and I think here, um, the literal translation. I think the um, the little translation of verse nine for valiant men is actually. Uh, Yeah, I'm just I'm looking here. Valiant men of of strength or men capable of using the sword, a man of strength drawing a sword. So it sounds like maybe in um maybe, and this is just conjecture, maybe in Israel it was those who were able to um able to fight and use the sword, while in Judah it was uh a different group that was counted. I mean, I'm not sure a hundred percent. It's just no, I it's just interesting saying, the way you're saying that, you know. It, Pointing that yeah, out. Per, perhaps they, because obviously what's also not mentioned here are women and children. Right. And so maybe they're making a distinction between able-bodied men, we might say today, those who um, are eligible to fight, and then those who are more likely to be in the position of being taken care of by somebody, right? Being being mm-hmm. the recipient of mercy. So I don't know. I just, just sort of stood out to me as I was reading. Uh, but the next part is really what is interesting because with verse 10 it says, But David's heart struck him after he numbered the people. And David said to Yahweh, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Yahweh, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. I'm going to pause there at the end of 10. So just reading that extra verse we see here that as soon as the numbers come back, David is just slain in his sin, right? He is convicted by the sin. He goes right to Yahweh, and all that's great. But you, you mentioned it earlier when you said the word pride. David's sin, I would assume, is not having completed the census. Even though Joab talked him out of its censuses, if that's the plural for it, aren't, uh, aren't illegal according to God's will. We, we see other incidences of censuses, so I guess it probably lies in his attitude, or, or as you said earlier, his, I guess his disposition to, to, um, to want to have power and consolidate that power. I guess, where is the sin? I guess that's what I'm asking. Where is the sin? I, I believe the sin here is entrusting in your own power above the power of God, right? Um, certainly censuses are not uh, wrong. But when your pride is in how much do I have as opposed to trusting in God can do. And, uh, you know, this has been David's issue many times over. And I think we really see that with the, the sin with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. You know, he, he takes what is not his. He, he goes after what he wants. And, and that's his pride. And then he he's caught right she, Shiva becomes pregnant now he's got to figure out how to to fix this and instead of repenting and coming to god knowing god can fix all things and and can and uh forgive all things uh he takes matters into his own hands and he he still can't win and he still can't win he can't get him drunk he can't get him to go home he can't get him to do the things he wants him to do 
So I'll have him killed, you know, and this is all boils down to David's pride and David's feeling of his own control, his own power, um, having a God that is himself. Uh, he can do it. He doesn't need anybody else. And so here, David has done the same thing. He, he's taken matters into his own hands. He wants to know what his, his power is, uh, what his worth is, instead of trusting in, in Yahweh for the blessing and for, multi, as Joab says, you know, God, Yahweh God, he can add hundreds of times more. You don't need to worry about that. And yet David does anyway. You know, I, I'm looking at this too, and I wonder if it has to do with what we stumbled upon, and that is the description of the people. Maybe the census was done in such a manner as to highlight the power of his of his you know potential army size, um, rather than the people themselves. May I, and again, speculation, right? All we do know he sinned. Um, mm -hmm. We don't get a God off the hook for allowing him to be tempted because, you know, that's what we call a theodicy. We don't do that. God is in control. You can't have it both ways. But at the same time, he knows that he's done, quote, very foolishly. So his great sin could have been, just as what you're saying, is, is he was really building up himself. Instead of doing it for the sense of knowing who to take care of, he does it, and he only counts the people who could do something for him, grow his might. He, he, he sees his, his, I guess, nationalistic um, ego is, is, is absolutely uh, is, is stroked by this particular, the way that they describe the census. I don't know. I mean, and the numbers contradict once again. First Chronicles gives us some different numbers, and there's all different kinds of ways we can try to, try to um, reconcile those numbers. Most people just talk about rounding or armies and that kind of thing. The, the, the point, though, here, or even copyist errors, but the point here is that the, it seems like he's really emphasizing um, powerful soldier men, or but maybe that's how censuses were done. I mean, I don't actually know that. Yeah, I know in uh, Numbers chapter 1 that the age set from eligible military service was the age of 20. So was he counting those that were 20 and older? Um, was he counting those who had already entered into military service, you know, yeah, again, we don't, we don't know the number, what's being counted there, but you're right. I, I think, I think you're absolutely correct on that, that he, you know, it's David looking at how does he get power? How does he, you know, value, measure his worth as it were with uh, all these Kings and, you know, with all these soldiers backing up the King, uh, instead of giving worth and value to what God has done and what God has given to him, which would mate would probably be a census of all the people you know, of all, all the right. tribes. Well, either way, we see that David recognizes his sin before the Lord, and in true David style, in contrast to King Saul, he goes to the Lord. He seeks forgiveness. Um, so that's where we're going to leave it for a few minutes. David, recognizing his sin, going to the throne of God and praying for his iniquity to be washed away. We're going to consider that as we take a break. Folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor Heine and I will keep on going through 2 Samuel 24. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Jacob Heine, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas. Before we get back to the topic at hand, I want to remind you that you're welcome to reach out to me anytime with your questions or your comments. You can find me via email at pastorboo at gmail.com 
or you can reach me on Facebook. Now, if you're looking to take the show on the road, maybe catch up while in the car, you know, it's an hour a day. Some people just can't commit all that time, but they don't want to miss some of their favorite passages or something they didn't quite understand, or maybe they want to listen to it again. Well, whether you're in the car, on a long flight, even maybe from the beach this summer, you could be listening to KFUO. Can you believe it? Well, if that's if that's something you want to do, I recommend you look into subscribing. You can subscribe to Thy Strong Word as a podcast. Um, any of your podcast platforms are going to allow you to do that. But if you're new to podcasting, I highly recommend the KFUO radio app. You can download that onto your Apple or your, I, uh, your uh, Android phone. You can listen to the station live as it streams out, just like you were in St. Louis. Or you could subscribe and listen on demand to many of KFUO's great programs. Um, Thy Strong Word is really just a, just a couple of clicks away, and it always keeps you up to date. And you can also live uh, listen live or de- on demand at kfpo.org. Either way, you're never far from, from uh, great hosts, hopefully. <laughs> I'm stumbling today, but also the knowledgeable guest, he's going to save me today. They're all looking to connect you to God's Word. Well, let's get back into that uh, fantastic guest we have today. As I stumble over my words, I'm not sure. I'm not really sleeping well lately, so I'm having a little trouble, but... Here we are uh, back onto the text, and we've just gotten to the point where David's heart struck him after he numbered the people. And he goes to God, he goes to Yahweh, and he says, I've sinned greatly in what I've done, but now, O Yahweh, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. Anything else you want the people to know before we hear what happens next? Yeah, I think this verse is almost one of the keys to this section because it shows how David has grown and how his, how God has worked in his life, his faith, uh, walk, the different things that God has brought to him. You know, back in Second Samuel 11, when David sinned with Bathsheba and uh, killed Uriah, you know, he didn't see anything wrong with it. He, he felt justified and, and validated in what he did. It took the prophet Nathan coming to him and telling him the parable of the sheep and pointing out, you know, when David's wrath was kindled in this parable, uh, that, you know, you're that man, you are that man who did this. And then David was cut when he realized uh, his sin. Here, it doesn't take the prophet Gad coming to him to point him out. He realizes on his own. He's able to recognize his own sinfulness, his own brokenness here, and come to Yahweh himself, even before it's pointed out to him and say, you know, I've sinned. I, I've made a mistake. You know, oh, oh, Yahweh, wipe away my iniquity. Uh, make me clean again uh, because I've been foolish. I've been unwise in what I have done. And you, you can see how David has grown as a king, as a leader, and as a man of God in this to be able to recognize his own sin. Well, that's a message for us too, right? I mean, we shouldn't wait to the point where someone else has to point out the sin in our life. We shouldn't have to wait till even God himself, you know, delivers to us some sort of consequence to our from our sins that make us have to beg his forgiveness. It's much better to continue to examine our hearts and go to the Lord once we recognize our sin, which is easy to do because unfortunately we sin all the time. We continue to struggle with that, this side of the Lord's return. So David's heart struck him. Yeah. But then, verse 11, we do get the prophet coming on the scene. Here we go. And when David arose in the morning, the word of Yahweh came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says Yahweh, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land, or will you flee? three months from before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hands of Yahweh, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Uh, Pausing right there, we still don't know what's going to happen, but it's interesting David's response is interesting, but I think what really stands out to us is God's going to him through the prophet and is basically saying, okay, there's going to be a consequence to your sin. It's one of these three you get to pick. Uh, That seems pretty unusual to me. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I was trying to think earlier if there's any other uh, story of God coming to his people and saying, all right, you decide what the punishment's going to be. Uh, and there may be, and I'm drawing a blank on it and cannot come up with one, but yeah, it certainly is different than what David experienced in Second Samuel 12 when God says, okay, here's the punishment. Here's the consequences for your sin. Your, your son will die. And the, you know, what happens there, obviously we know that it comes to pass here. It's so different. He says, yes, there's consequences. You know, you, you are, there's forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is great, but there's also consequences to our actions. So uh, the consequences of the, the King are uh, handed down uh, to the nation here in this case, and but David gets to choose. And I can't think of another time in scripture where someone gets to choose what their what their punishment was. No, I'm struggling to and I think that's why it stands out so much to me, because we certainly have, as you pointed out, there are consequences for sin. God even judges his people, disciplines his people by bringing upon them calamities. This is a calamity. It is a result of David's sin as their leader, but you know, it, it can't, you can't help but look at that and go, wait a minute, this seems like a trap, <laughs> or at the very least, a test, right? Yahweh's not doing anything to him for his harm, but it does make you wonder, what's the deal with this? Why is this different? And, and, and so David, I think, answers rightly, right? He's chosen correctly because David doesn't pick one, and, unless I'm missing it. David says does. to Gad, David says to Gad, I'll just rely on the mercy of the Lord. Yeah. Well, he doesn't pick, but he does eliminate. So he, you know, he's given the three options. Oh, that's you know, true. Yeah. Right. First, he, you know, I, I can send pestilence or I can send the sword or I can send famine. And he says, well, don't let me fall in the hands of the sword. I don't want to fall in the hands of, of other men. You're, so you're right. I was trying so hard to be good to David here, but you're right. He's like, He's like, yeah, uh, no, whatever happens, just don't let it happen to me personally. Okay, well, sorry, David. Well, in, in some ways, yes, but also he, I think he he's saying, I know what men can do, and I know what God is. You know, God is merciful, mm. uh, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Man is not. And so he says, I would rather fall into the arms of God than ever fall in the arms of man because I know what, what God, you know, I know my God. Um, and I, I believe this, you know, though he... he you know, he might he might be coming a little pious and a little prideful here too, but I th I think he's more realizing what he did before. He didn't trust God. He trusted man. He trusted himself. And so now he turns around and says, no, let me trust God. You know, I didn't do it before. Let me trust God. God's ways will be the best ways. And no, you're 100% correct. He's making a very uh, a good stand here. He's saying, I'm going to let the Lord decide but at the same time, as you so clearly pointed out, and it makes perfect sense to me, he's saying, if I have to choose between whoever's going to be set against me, I would much rather it be Yahweh, who's merciful and just, rather than man who is wicked, right? Right. And, and that's exactly, well, how it falls down. We're, we're going to read the next part, starting with verse 15. So Yahweh sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, Yahweh relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of Yahweh was by the threshing floor of uh, Aranua, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to Yahweh when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Okay, that's the end of verse 17. So the Lord sends a pestilence. He sends the pestilence as he said he would. Um, we had three years of famine, three months before your foes, or three days of pestilence. It really just says he sent it until the appointed time, but I guess we can assume that's three days. Yeah, commentators kind of go back and forth on this, either three days or uh, a lot of times the appointed time uh, is used in the Old Testament as the appointed time of the evening sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice of, of mm. uh, forgiveness. So there's, 
there's some debate between the scholars of whether this would be the appointed time of three days, which would make sense in the, the context, or if it's the foreshadowing of the sacrifice to come uh, that pays for the sins of all the world. Uh, and I think we could probably go both ways on that and be safe uh, in our interpretation there. But 70,000 men died. That, yeah. it's, it still seems like a very harsh punishment, um, and really, you know, it's hard for us to reconcile, and I'm just going to be honest, as we look at this and we say, well, David is the one who sins, and 70,000 men of his incur the punishment. Mm -hmm. And this is true even till today, uh, when leaders sin, you know, a lot of times who takes the brunt of the consequences of those actions? You know, a leader of a country or a leader of an organization or a church when they, you know, that sin happens, uh, unfortunately, what, what comes down is the, the people suffer, right? And, um, and it doesn't seem fair. There's a lot of times where we say, you know, God, this doesn't seem fair, but God's love isn't fair either because the reality is, is we all deserve that death. We all deserve that punishment for our sins and our sinfulness. And yet God doesn't give us the eternal damnation, the eternal punishment that we deserve. And, uh, you know, again, we, we come back almost to the, the beginning of this where God's anger is kindled against uh, Israel and incites David. And we were once again saying, you know, well, why God, why? And we, we can't talk about the hidden things of God, uh, but we can talk about his revealed uh, grace and love and justice for us in Christ our Lord. It's kind of interesting, too, because in David's oracle, in his last words, he was talking about the, what it looked like to have righteousness uh, be in, 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 in control, to have a ruler who is ruling according to God's will and the blessings it has for the people. And now here we have a very clear demonstration of what it looks like when righteousness does not reign among the rulers, and as you pointed out, the people themselves suffer, which is also why it was so important that the leaders of Israel, pointing forward, of course, to the King of Kings, Jesus, why it's so important to pursue righteousness, to, to lead according to God's will, because it's not just, when you're a leader, it's not just you you have to worry about. You have to be concerned for your own people because your decisions affect them. And so I'm glad you brought that out because that still continues today, as you said. Absolutely. And David's response here even shows that, you know, he says, look, I, I messed up. I was the one who was wicked. Um, these sheep haven't done anything. And, and so stop, you know, stop punishing them. And he takes responsibility and he, t he takes that spot and says, may, may your wrath come to me and not to others. And obviously we, you know, David, and we look forward to the, the true King, uh, you know, in the line of David, who does the same thing, uh, in our place, God's wrath comes on Christ instead of on us. And on the cross, uh, God pours out all his wrath on his son, Jesus, who is the, the king in the line of David, who stands between uh, God's wrath and his people. And David does the same thing here, stopping God's wrath and saying, no, you know, let it be on me, not on them. Well, and God stops it too. The angel of Yahweh, when he was stopped, it, he stopped right there uh, by the threshing floor of uh, Era Una or Ornon, if you look at Chronicles, the Jebusite. Um, I guess it's worth talking about for a minute, the angel of Yahweh. We actually haven't heard from the angel of the Lord in a while. Um, Pre-incarnate Christ here, you think? I believe so, and I think most uh, of our church fathers would agree that the angel, and you know, there's some question as to, is the angel who's doing the destruction the angel of Yahweh, the pre-incarnate Christ here, or is there a separation between the angel who is, who's bringing death and Yahweh, uh, Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ who stands by the threshing floor. Uh, and the way it reads to me, I, I think they might be two separate, but I think it could go both ways. But here, you know, it, just like in Jacob at the Jabbok wrestling with Yahweh and the burning bush and uh, many other times, uh, Joshua also worshiping the angel of Yahweh, we see what most scholars and certainly our early church fathers all attested to as being uh, the second person of the Trinity coming and showing up on the scene to, to, to 
uh, push us forward and give us a, uh, a theology into the New Testament, uh, certainly because we know uh, this threshing floor is actually where the temple is going to be built. Yeah, and that's what I was going to point out, right? So the location's important. He's at the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite, or Orna, and uh, we're going to hear that again right now, actually, as I read verse 18 and following. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, rise, raise an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as Yahweh commanded. And when Arauna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arauna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Arauna said, Why has my lord the king come to this servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, in order to build an altar to Yahweh, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Arauna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aaron Una gives to the king. And Aaron Una said to the king, May Yahweh your God accept you. But the king said to Aaron Una, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to Yahweh my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver, and David built there an altar to Yahweh and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Yahweh responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. Thus ends the entire book of Second Samuel, or Fourth Kings, depending on how you number it. But yeah, so here we are. It's sort of a little bit of an imminent domain going on. The king shows up at this guy's place and says, I'm buying this land from you, right? You really don't have a choice. But look at the faithfulness of Arauna. We love it, right? He he honors uh, the anointed of Yahweh. He's he's ready to basically give it away. Whatever you want, you can have, especially since it's for the for the Lord for Yahweh. Uh, but David, um, he has some honor in here too. But this is certainly a better story to end on than how it began with uh, once again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Uh, but what is it? What is it teaching us? Yeah, I, it's. This goes back to Second Samuel seven, where David says, "You know, I I'm living in a palace, and you know Yahweh, the Ark of the Covenant, is in a tent. I'm going to build a temple." And you know Nathan nearly says, "Okay, go do it," and then gets word from from Yahweh, "No, that's not David's role. You know, he's to build the nation. Uh, his 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 son will build me a, a temple," and. Yet David, it seems, all his life has wanted to do something, has wanted to put the, the steps into motion in order to build the temple for, for uh, Yahweh. And now, uh, as he's coming to the end of his life, he gets the opportunity to, to purchase the, the spot, the land of which uh, this would happen under uh, Solomon. Yeah, interestingly, in verse 19, uh, we get this, this wonderful small section that I think is easy to overlook as, you know, so David went up at Gad's word as Yahweh commanded. And this is the only time that phrase as Yahweh commanded is used in uh, Samuel, anywhere in Samuel, hmm. uh, though it's found in many other places, especially in the, in the Torah, but here in, in Samuel, that's the only time that phrase is used as Yahweh is commanded and David shows himself faithful, right? Yahweh has told him to do something uh, through the prophet. And now, uh, David, the king, does exactly what God wants him to, and he shows himself to be faithful ruler, the faithful leader, uh, even though, you know, a man, as he was called, a man after God's own heart. He truly shows this once again at the end of his life, and even though he has sinned multiple times, as we all have, he still follows God's command and does exactly what he's, he's called to do. And Aruna, who wants to be also uh, accommodating and loving and, and give to, to Yahweh says, yeah, you can use my spot. I'll give you all, my, I'll give you everything, right? I'll give you the, the threshing floor and I'll give you the oxen and you can, you can use the wood and you can do your sacrifice here. But David says, no, I want it to be permanent, right? I, I don't want it just to be a one use t uh, sacrifice. I want this to be a permanent location for God. And Arauna takes it. Yes, he can have, this can be a permanent location for God. And here the, the sacrifice is made, here the, the temple will be built, 
all that God has set in motion is done and accomplished uh, here at the end of Second Samuel and at the end of David's life. So really this whole chapter, it, it begins with David the king and his sins. It, it continues through his recognition of sin without even having to be called to account. It, it, it continues with him then being uh, listening to the words of God's uh, appointed, not anointed, but appointed, the prophet. And then it, it ends with his repentance and David being faithful and having uh, subjects that are faithful. It really is, I guess, despite what we might think at the very beginning, a very roundabout way of looking at the Christian's life, uh, the life, of course, uh, Israel as a whole, but also what we should be looking for. We should be repenting of our sins, continuing to seek after God's Word, and of course being faithful um, as, as to the best of our abilities as the Lord provides for us. So I guess it turns out to be a fairly decent way to end Second Samuel. Yeah, I think it's a great ending to, uh, as you said, Fourth Kings, maybe Second Samuel. Uh, <laughs> right. As everything is wrapped up here, and we see the you know the king of David and the uh, who will usher in and be you know the line from which Christ will come and you know hear the the offering the sacrifice is accepted and God accepts the sacrifice of His Son as well uh, just just down the hill from where this new temple will be built and where this sacrifice was all offered. Christ's sacrifice for us and his resurrection for us gives us that hope and that future that we, like David, have sins forgiven and life everlasting with our Lord. Well, I think that's a good point upon which to end our program. Folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Jacob Heine, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas. Brother, thanks for being on the show, and I look forward to having you back on soon. I'll look forward to it. It was a wonderful time and always a, a joy to study God's Word with, it, with the people. <laughs> thank you. All right, folks. Well, that that ends. It ends first and second Samuel. We're done. Can you believe it? What a fascinating um I, I would say tale, but it's true. It's history. It's God's activity throughout history through the people that he has chosen, pointing forward to our Lord and Savior Jesus and of course Israel today, which is you. On Monday, we're going to do something a little different. We're switching gears. We're actually leaving the Old Testament. I'm tired of butchering Hebrew names. We're going to move into the New Testament. I'll butcher some Greek names for a while. We're going to do the book of Acts, a brand new study. In Acts chapter 1, we find ourselves at a significant moment in history, right? This is the period right after Jesus's resurrection. It, it's the sequel to Luke. Uh, it's the birth of the early Christian church. And this chapter, uh, Acts 1, sets the foundation for all these extraordinary events that will unfold as the disciples fulfill God's command, right? As they grapple with their new mission, as they learn to understand the arrival and purpose of the Holy Spirit, and their calling to spread the message of the gospel to the entire earth. So come along with us on Monday, folks, as we begin our new study, and we set out in exploration of the beginnings of the New Testament church. That's going to be Acts chapter 1. Until then, folks, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.